If you want to become an aviation instructor at any level, the FAA's Aviation Instructor's Handbook is a must read. The FAA just published an updated edition of this manual. Here on the Powered Parachute Show, we are going to talk about the changes in the manual, why you want this manual, what is in it, and how to get it. Before we get rolling, I want to thank you for supporting the channel. And I hope that if you want to learn more about flying powered parachutes, that you check out my website, easyflight.com. The link is below in the description. Powered parachutes are for a unique way to get into the sky and allow you to share the experience with loved ones and friends. In fact, I hope you enjoy this little tour of the Greenville Airport in Greenville, Illinois. Don't worry, this isn't how I normally fly, but I wanted you to see the airport from a powered parachute point of view. Let's get to the topic, and the topic is the FAA's updated Aviation Instructor's Handbook, or as they lovingly call it, FAA-H-8083-9B. This handbook was written for flight instructors, ground instructors, and aviation maintenance instructors. I've been teaching content from the earlier versions of this manual since the 90s. I appreciate the content, but I have noticed that a lot of pilots aren't particularly fond of the subject matter. After all, it doesn't seem to directly relate to flying. And those pilots are sort of correct. It directly relates to instructing. It covers topics like communication, psychology, teaching theory, and risk management. You know, the squishy topics that we need to know to be good instructors. Let's talk about the new edition and compare it to the previous version, which was released in 2008, over a decade ago. The layout of the handbook has changed a lot since that last edition. The content's very familiar but how it's presented is different. Some things stand out immediately with a side-by-side -side comparison. The first thing that the new version doesn't have is a table of contents. I'm not crazy about this since a table of contents really helps applicants during the check ride when they're trying to find an answer to an examiner's question. It reduces fumbling around in the book when applicants are under the stress of trying to find an answer quickly. Knowing the FAA though, they wanted to keep the page count identical to the last edition, it is, and the six pages dedicated to the table of contents from the early version were sacrificed with the addition of other content in this new version. Another layout issue is that there are no chapter opening pages. The beginnings of chapters just kind of start with the text at the top of the new page. That reduces the professional look of the document and on a practical level makes it a little more difficult to find new chapters. But doing that saves space. Again, I suspect that is because the FAA wanted to keep the page count identical with the prior edition. By the way, the FAA doesn't normally write or illustrate these handbooks themselves. They contract that out to vendors who bid on the handbook projects. The contract will specify the page count, amongst other things. The FAA certainly reviews the book before it's published, making it a collaborative effort. But certain things like page count are normally not negotiable after the contract is approved. The chapters are mostly the same, although they change the order. For example, risk management is now the first chapter in the book, but it's also the last chapter in the book. In total, there are over double the pages dedicated to risk management with 38 pages in the new edition compared to 18 pages in the old edition. So perhaps we can see why some of the other areas were trimmed down. There's something else that's hard to miss, even if you aren't familiar with book layouts. The most obvious change is that they went from a two-column layout to a single-column layout. Warning now, I'm about to get publishing geeky on you. Laying out a magazine and a book, which I am trying to do well, means that I had to study such things. So let me share. A two-column layout is normally much easier to read with the 9 to 12 words at a time. That is something that's been studied. Those studies show that our eyes don't read character by character or even word by word. Rather, our eyes scan a line of a text, pausing momentarily to process groups of three or four words. Studies have found that a reader can make three or four such pauses on a line before it becomes tiring. So a major readability rule was broken because instead of nine to 12 words in a line, the new handbook has 20 or more words in a line, about twice the standard. 
Now this decision may have been made as a compromise. This makes the content far easier to read on a digital device. Instead of scrolling up and down from column to column on the same page, it's a straight read. Also, a lot of the text is organized in the bullet points and those seem easier for me to read because the bullets line up cleaner on the left side of the page. And since the document uses a lot of bold subheadings, it's nice to see them also line up on the side of the page. So overall, this is probably an improvement. We can walk through the chapters to give you a feel for what the handbook is all about. This will give you an insight into the kinds of things that instructors really need to know. This insight can help even if you're just a student learning to fly, or, or learning to do anything else for that matter, if for some reason things aren't clicking with your instructor, or your progress learning to fly doesn't seem to really be progressing, the answer may lie in this manual. So let's talk about those chapters. What I'm going to do is talk about the chapters themselves and list some of the main topics you can find in those chapters. If something seems a little confusing, that's at least one good reason to get the handbook and read it in detail. So let's start with Chapter 1, Risk Management and Single Pilot Resource Management. Aviation is a matter of balancing risk and benefit. What this chapter does is give pilots and instructors tools for analyzing that risk. This is the way it's organized. There are sections on principles of risk management, implementing the risk management process, flight risk assessment tools, the 3P model for pilots, pilot self-assessment, situational awareness, single pilot resources management or SRM, aeronautical decision making, teaching decision making skills, and assessing SRM skills. This is a major emphasis area for the FAA, which is why so many pages are dedicated to it. Next, we come to Chapter 1, which is, well, the old Chapter 1, which is now Chapter 2, Human Behavior. This chapter talks about behavior and how it affects the learning process. It was written to help instructors understand why people act the way they do and how people learn. So it's, it's really basically just psychology. Well, not just psychology. Psychology is a big deal. Teaching someone to fly can be intense for the student. Understanding human behavior, basic human needs, the defense mechanisms humans use that prevent learning, and how adults learn is critical for instructors. Some instructors instinctively know some of these things, but it's great to see a lot of important principles just spelled out. This is what the FAA does, and the handbook does it pretty well. This is also where the FAA discusses motivation. Motivation is so important for instructors to understand so their students can ultimately become pilots. Sections here include definitions of human behavior, motivation, maintaining motivation, human needs and motivation, defense mechanisms, learner emotional reactions, and teaching the adult learner. The next chapter is chapter three, the learning process. This starts with learning theory, yeah, more psychology, but it also has a lot of practical advice for aviation instructors wanting to connect with their students and help them quickly acquire knowledge. It is the largest chapter in the handbook with 42 pages. Sections here are what is learning, learning theory, that's just straight up psychology there, perceptions, insight, acquiring knowledge, laws of learning, domains of learning, characteristics of learning, learning styles, acquiring skill knowledge, types of practice, evaluation versus critique, scenario-based training, errors, memory, forgetting, retention of learning, and finally, transfer of learning. For me, this is always the material that ironically needs review because some of it seems to overlap so much. You can see even the names overlap quite a bit. And oh yeah, I forget. So the next chapter is chapter four effective communication. When you think about it, communication is a core skill for flight instructors. Understanding how communication works, yes, it's even more psychology, is important for all teachers. This chapter has sections on the basic elements of communication, barriers to communication, and developing communication skills. We go from communication to chapter five, the teaching process. This is a nice fat chapter with 28 pages. This gets into the nuts and bolts of teaching. It covers essential teaching skills, instructor's code of ethics, preparation of a lesson, presentation of a lesson, organization of material, training delivery methods, including the lecture method, the discussion method, the guided discussion method, and the problem-based learning method, electronic learning, 
group learning method, demonstration performance method, drill and practice method, and that's the kind mostly used in the cockpit, instructional aids and technologies, and test preparation material, and more. Like I said, it, it's kind of a chunky chapter. Then we get to chapter six, which is assessment. And assessment is a fancy word for testing. And it turns out that you really don't know if what you're teaching is being taught if you don't check. That checking can be a formal test, like a knowledge test, a pre-solo test, or a check write. Or it can be less formal, like standing back and just watching to see if the student could do something without help and coaching. The assessment chapter includes sections on terminology, general characteristics of effective assessment, traditional assessment, authentic assessment, creating a method, critiques and oral assessments, and scenario-based training. Next up, Chapter 7, Planning and Instructional Activity. All of this theory is great, but at some point instructors have to plan a lesson. Good instructors have an entire syllabus to work from. Chapter 7 dives into the details of that process with sections on course of training, blocks of learning, training syllabus, lesson plans, and again, scenario-based training, and finally, single pilot resource management, which is kind of an again thing also. And then we get to Chapter 8, Aviation Instructor Responsibilities and Professionalism. This chapter emphasizes the intangibles that not only are important to the FAA, but are important to students and help guide instructors who are striving to be the best at what they do. This chapter talks about aviation instructor responsibilities, specific flight instructor responsibilities, the aviation model code of conduct, safe practices and accident prevention, flight instructor qualifications, professionalism, evaluation of learner ability and professional development. We're getting close to the end here, but next up is chapter nine, techniques of flight instruction. This chapter, and we're getting more and more detailed, gets into the nitty gritty of flight instruction. Sure, there's always going to be some theory, but this is a chapter that talks specifically about ground instruction, simulator instruction, flight instruction, how it all ties together. Sections here include practical flight instructor strategies, integrating instruction techniques, demonstration performance training, positive exchange of flight controls, the sterile flight deck rule, use of distractions, integrated flight instruction, and assessment of piloting ability. And finally, the last chapter is chapter 10, teaching practical risk management during flight instruction. Chapter 10 talks about the same things covered in chapter one. Only this time, the focus is on how to teach risk management to students. The idea is to integrate it into the flight training experience early in order to produce safer pilots. Sections here are poor risk management and accident causality, risk management training through the private pilot level, risk management training for experienced pilots, and managing risk during flight instruction. This book closes out with four appendices, a glossary, and a very important index. The index is critical for those getting ready for a check ride since it is about the only way to reference material quickly in a print version of the handbook. The appendices, though, include Appendix A, References, Appendix B, Developing a Test Item Bank, Appendix C, Certificates, Ratings, and Endorsements, and Appendix D, Personal Minimums Checklist. If you want to download the book for free, you can get it from the FAA's website. You can download the entire product or you can download individual chapters as needed. If you still like paper, you can buy a printed version of the handbook from ASA and other publishers. Links to both the FAA page and the ASA page are down in the description as well as a link to my main website, easyflight.com. Again, that's the place I hope you go and want to learn more about how to learn to fly part parachutes. Thanks so much for watching and blue skies.